kind of continue on with this project. I'm not sure what I want to ramble on about today. Um, how about Harbor Freight Tools? I have to pull a bearing off a crank and put a little bit of pressure on this one. Get it in behind that bearing. I suspect that bearing is just going to come right out of there. I don't think it's going to give us a whole lot of problem. A little bit more pressure. Since that bearing puller is in behind the bearing sufficiently, that bearing should come right off of there. And I do believe it will. I can do it by hand almost. So here's that OEM crank that I want to put into the junk pile Chinese 372 build. I think what I'm going to do now is see if I can get the cases uh, clean enough to where I can put the crank in there. You know, clean enough. Got to get it clean enough. And sometimes the cleaning of a saw takes more time than the actual work. The parts cleaner really helps. My parts cleaner failed on me. It was a Harbor Freight and uh, the pump died on it. So I've been out of a parts cleaner now for quite some time. And that's been an inconvenience for me, for sure. This is nothing more than a pure hobby saw. Fun and games. Nothing serious. You know, if it was a serious saw, I'd disassemble it and put in new bearings and seals because they're pretty cheap. But since it's uh, one of these Chinese fun and game saws, I'm just going to run it the way it is. And I think part of the fun I'm going to have with this is you'll probably see it crop up on the channel from time to time. I'll use it for firewood and stuff like that. And how long does it last? I mean, one of the premises that I've been going under for a long time is uh, you know I build for a little rougher crowd in the sense that a lot of the people who I've built saws for use them for making income you know basically feeding their family so the standards you know are a little bit higher but the funny thing I found is that in the hobby community And I'm not sure quite how to explain it, but you know, these sometimes in the hobby com community, people have a higher standard than even the professional, partly because everybody wants everything to be perfect, and I understand that. And part of it is not really understanding how much you can get away with with some of these these little simple two strokes. And. Uh, And those bearings are hard, you know. Instead of taking an abrasive or something like that, that's as hard or almost as hard as they are to hurt them. And uh, grease and gummy stuff like this is not something that's going to hurt those bearings, you know, in, in little doses. It take a lot of a lot of doses to make it really hurt them. And what would get them is not so much the material passing through. That's usually softer than the metal they are. What would hurt them is the uh, degradation in the in the lubrication. That's what's going to get them. But I'm going to get it out of there anyway. So that's good enough. Get this side here. Using OEM gasket, I'm going to have to open up the holes for those uh, locating pins because the locating pin is actually substantially larger in diameter than the OEM one. Let me see if I've got a Chinese. Gasket. Yeah, look at that. See, I lucked out. I've got some Farmer Tech gaskets, so I can use those on the Chinese cases that have the larger holes. What are the chances? Don't look bad. Now this one actually had come out of a an X Torque, an early one, and it's one that had the PTO bearing fail. Now my theory, 
has been now for a little while that uh, the nylon cage bearings may not be quite as resistant as the steel cage bearings to heat. Let me roll back. Let me go back to this one right here. This is an X-Torque case and an X-Torque cylinder that I got bolted on the one half. And this is one of the many that had the PTO side bearing go out of it, and that was nylon. Now if you look at those bearings, I don't know, see if the light, let me put some light on it. You'll see how black it is down there. I mean, they, they got really hot. And this is one, yet again, that the PTO side had failed. And what my theory is now is if those nylons were running at a temperature they were designed to run, they're a little bit smoother and possibly a little bit less vibration. And they last just fine. That's not what killed them, is the, the design application. What happened was either a part or a manufacturing problem created a situation where those bearings ran a little bit hot. And while the steel cage bearings could handle the heat, the nylon uh, bearings couldn't. That's my theory. And the reason why they ran hot comes into one or two or three different reasons. One is there might have been a, a misalignment one bearing pocket to the other one. So that bearing was running at a little bit of an angle. And uh, the side load made it run a little bit hotter. That's theory number one. Theory number two is on installation, maybe they pushed up a little bit of an aluminum chip and didn't seat properly, so now the bearing itself is not quite square in the pocket. That could have caused them to run an eccentric and then a side load, therefore, you know, add heat and, you know, eventually fail because of that. Theory number three is that the rod bearing, the wrist pin, the piston, the crankshaft, but that entire system wasn't in good balance. And not being in good balance, it added a, a vibration to the bottom end, which eventually pounded out the bearing pockets. And the reason why that one holds a little credibility is they simply couldn't handle the vibration was, well, one of my uh, 372 XPWs had steel cage bearings. The cases rattled apart. I mean, the case screws backed right out. I did a video on that where it was, but basically the XPW uh, had a larger piston, but was on the same crank that the standard 372 was. And the common denominator was that the X torque had a larger piston as well. So let me see. Here's a standard 372 piston. This is the next torque, which is substantially heavier. So obviously Husqvarna is going to have to do something to sort of make the vibrations a little bit less when they hang that bigger, heavier piston on there. And while I have never seen a standard 50 millimeter original edition uh, 372 rattle apart, Certainly not the 365s, the 48 millimeter. I did see a 51.4 millimeter version of that saw rattle apart. And that was this one right here. And I did a video where I took it apart and it was beyond repair because the case it had the cases had rattled apart and the PTO bearing pocket itself was beat open, so you really couldn't use the case anymore because I could just drop a bearing in there. It didn't have any bite on that bearing. I don't know. I did that video back in 2018, I think it was. So, yet again, the 51.4 piston is larger, heavier than the 50 millimeter 372. And without doing anything to the balance of that system, maybe they created a problem that made those cases come apart. I did another video recently where I had a 2010 uh, 372 X Torque, and it too had the cases that were rattled apart. It also had steel cage bearings, and 
the common denominator is both those saws had a larger than the original edition standard piston, so they were a little bit heavier. So, so the vibration characteristics were probably different, which might have been why those cases rattled apart. Another factor in those, just to keep adding stuff up to get things more and more confusing, is the cases of that era often had plastic locating pens, and it may have been the combination of the bigger piston not being totally balanced and those plastic locating pins. See, this is all speculation on my part. I'm not trying to say I know the answer, but I am saying that I'm building kind of a, a data set for me to work from, and this is the background that I had seen that kind of worked me to come to my conclusions on how I was going to build the X-Torx, which has been successful, by the way. And uh, these are the kinds of things which I believe could have added to the stack of things which caused those failures. Now, I say that as if they failed. Both the saws that I brought forward as, as samples, the 372 XPW and the original 2010 um, x torque they both had run a service life. It's like the people are not unhappy with the service life of those saws. It wasn't like they just fell apart right after they came out of the box, you know. They put a couple of years in, they paid for themselves, and when they finally did fail, the case screws had rattled out. And in the case of the XPW, one screw rattled out and got stuck in the flywheel and dug around on the inside of the case, making a mess there. Point being, um, of the three different theories, alignment, um, missing a poorly installed bearing, where it was not aligned properly on installation. Both of those things could add heat. And the vibration, because of the larger piston, all three of those things could have come together to create the kind of issues we had in that 2010 through 2014 era on 372s. I'm going to note that the XPW, when it came apart, it did take out the PTO side case bearing pocket, but it did not kill the bearings. They survived. They were fine. The same with the 372 X Torque that I just finished putting together, where the cases had rattled apart and it failed because it started drawing air in, ready to lean. Did not damage the cases and did not damage the bearings. I put it right back together and they looked fine. The nylon cage bearings that came later, maybe they were there to mitigate some vibration issues. Maybe that was what their purpose was. They would fail catastrophically. And, you know, we've got sample after sample of those. I got them laying all over the floor because um, my bucket spilled, where the cases wouldn't rattle apart, but the bearing would actually fail. And then the bearing would let the crank wobble around, and then that would beat the bearing pocket open, and then the case was ruined. But somewhere around 2017, Husqvarna made some upgrades and they actually offered a different crank. It was a different uh, crank with different, I'm sure they had different weights or different rod bearing pins and stuff like that. I know it was a different crank and along with a few other things, I've never seen one fail since. So whatever they did, they both run pretty smooth, and they run for a long period of time, and that's with the nylon cage bearings. So, going back to my original theory, it was other things that added stress to the nylon cage bearings that pushed them past their performance envelope that oftentimes the steel cage bearings would have survived, but with the steel cage bearings, the cases would rattle apart, and with the nylon cage bearings, the bearing would fail and then eventually would beat open the, um, the PTO side bearing pocket. And that was a not uncommon failure on a high hour 372 X torque. And uh, in fact, the 372 XPW had rattled itself so far apart that it beat op open that PTO side pocket as well. So. The litany was, this new case was introduced, and I don't know what year, but somewhere around 2009, because the, uh, the additional meat here 
was on that XPW case. They had already built that casting to accept the deeper flange that the x torques had. And the XPW cylinder with the heavier piston um, was designed to be a little bit more powerful saw for the longer bars. And I mean, they ran good. Um, I did have that one failure where it wasn't my saw, it was a saw that came to me. And that might have been sort of a precursor to what was going to come. And maybe Husqvarna started scrambling on that when they saw the steel cage bearing cases rattling apart both of the XPW. And I'm sure they tested the X Torx and they may have seen that same problem, you know, early on. And they went to the nylon cage bearing is my speculation. This is not something I know for a fact. I know they went to the nylon cage bearing. I just don't know why. And I'm speculating that maybe part of what they were trying to do is reduce the vibration in the bottom end. So those things weren't rattling apart. It's possible, right? And then we started having the PTO side bearings fail. And I heard rumor that there was either a bearing installation problem or a machining problem in the case. Well, okay. That would be in addition to. <laughs> maybe it was that way all along, which is why they were vibrating apart. I don't know. But uh, either way, uh, they eventually fixed that. And then you started seeing more reliable uh, results with the saws subsequent. And then eventually they changed the crank and a few other things and then the new versions after 2017 from what I can tell have been really reliable. So there's the litany. That's my uh, uh, speculation. There's no fact in that that I can really tell you. I can just show you what I've seen and I've showed them in the videos over time. But I think that was sort of the litany of the 372 cases when they started pushing in uh, pushing the barriers, so to speak, when they started putting the bigger pistons, not just from the X-Torque, but also the XPWs. And uh, all speculation, I'm telling you right now, it's all speculation. The engineers, I'm sure they understand what's going on. It's not something they're going to broadcast, but I'm sure they know uh, certainly better than I how that all played out. So I'm going to close that off. And I don't think I'm going to bring up the subject of bearing failures in 372s again unless there's a reason to. I think that kind of closes off that chapter because, like I said, after 2017, it seems to be just a non-issue. But the reason why it's relevant is because it's interesting. But also there's a lot of people dealing with these junk pile saws just like I am. And, you know, getting those saws in that era, it just gives you something to think about. What I found was that there was different crank pins in the smaller crank pin that had the smaller diameter hole th through that pin that holds the, uh, the rod bearing. That seemed to be common on the early 372s. And then that crank pin inside diameter began to change. Well, first there was a chamfer and then there was a difference in the diameter that showed up as time went on as well. And I think that's part of what was happening to make them balance better with the bigger pistons, just putting less mass on that whole system. And the other thing is, if you've ever seen the wrist pins on the, um, the OEM, this is like a wrist pin you'd see on a, a standard 372 right here. This is actually for the, um, the Chinese saw. But the actual OEM wrist pin for a 372 X Torque is like paper thin. Let me see if I can find one. Let me shut the camera off and see if I can find one. See the difference in the inside diameter? This one here is an OEM and it's very, very thin. This one here is from the Chinese saw. It's quite a bit thicker. So this is really interesting as well. This is the Chinese crankshaft that failed. The wrist pin bearing is actually quite a bit larger in diameter. That failed, but the wrist pin bearing is quite a bit larger. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if they killed themselves by putting a, a larger, heavier bearing in here. Look at the size of that. I wonder if this saw rattled itself apart because it's just fundamentally out of balance. I do know it vibrated quite a bit.
as compared to the stalker. Let me see if I've got a stock wrist pin bearing. This is really interesting. I don't know if you see this. This is the crank that failed. It was an X-Torque clone that uh, rod bearing just basically toasted itself. And look at the inside diameter of that rod bearing pin right there. As compared to an X-Torque crank. This is an early X-Torque, but it's an X-Torque just the same. So that means this is heavier, the piston's heavier. They probably introduced a vibration just by having a heavier pin and a heavier bearing. Probably hurt themselves. Maybe that's one of the reasons why this saw failed in six months of professional use. I blamed it on the fact that I increased the compression. You know, but when you think about it, if my narrative is correct. That would be why this thing failed as quickly as it did. It took about six months, you know, and it just beat itself to death. Look at that. So we've got a few things that are different between the Chinese X-Torque and the uh, OEM X-Torque. I would not have guessed the, the, the wrist pin bearing being different. All right, I'm going to see if I can't find a stock wrist pin bearing the stock with the stock Husqvarna wrist pin and this is a stock crank fits right in there and that's a very thin wall it's got a larger inside diameter so the it's a very thin part nice fit right there the inside diameter of the pin that holds a rod bearing is smaller than the Chinese one by quite a bit and this bearing right here in the top of the connecting rod is quite a bit larger. Quite a bit. It's actually visibly larger. I'm going to say by eye it's, it's almost 50 thousandths larger in diameter. So that whole connecting rod assembly plus the rod bearing is larger than the stock X-Torque. Now remember this one failed by rattling itself apart the rod bearing failed, and then uh, it opened up the cases a little bit too. It started just basically killing itself, beating itself apart. And I, when it came back, making a racket because the piston was slapping the top of the cylinder, you know, Matt brought it right back to me. It had more vibration as a saw, the uh, aftermarket one did. So that would add credence to my whole theory that what Husqvarna struggled with in the first few years of those X-Torques was basically vibration you know that plus possibly a twisted alignment issue in the bearing combination of the two and by the way there's a new X-Torque case that uh, replaced even this version where they've made some changes on the bar oiling area of the cases and maybe some others I don't know so there's been the first change that we had identified where there was more material up in here, actually, I'm going to use this one, to accommodate the deeper flange on the cylinder. And then they changed the crank. Um, and then they changed the case, and I'm not sure if they changed the crank again, but I know they changed the case as well. And like I said, I haven't seen one fail since quite a few years now. And while I'm here, it may be of interest to people, but one of the reasons why I cut the skirt on these things is if you look in here, you can see how much the uh, skirt on that cylinder interferes with the bottom of that transfer. Look how small those transfers are. Yeah, I've just touched on that one because it's what I do. I radius them a little bit. But the cross-sectional area of that transfer is actually pretty small. You know, they put that wave in the, in the skirt. Really all they did was they just shrunk the intake to match the actual size of that, uh, that transfer port. Otherwise, they, they interfered with the cross-sectional area of the case that's designed for 
transfer ports that are like that, which are quite a bit larger. See, that matches up pretty nice with the case. But the X-Torque transfers are, are quite a bit smaller. And it looks to me like they probably added that area in the flange just sort of block off the entrance to the lower transfers just a little bit. And what I've done on the ones I build is I, I open that right back up and I kind of radius this in here. I don't go any wider than the actual transfer. I don't know if it really matters. And uh, I've noticed a substantial change in how they run by making that modification, the combination of radiusing the bottom of the transfers and, and cutting out that section of the of the flange seems to make a difference but um, I think another I guess little bit of information or this is a little bit of a speculation on my part is one of the reasons why Husky limited the RPMs on these with a 13,300 13, RPM limited ignition it was because that whole balance issue that I've just spent the last hour talking about keeping the RPMs down. And I remember early on that when I used to set up the saws, I did some of that for the dealers and for my customers, I would turn them down to about 12.9 and they put a little more oil in there. They never failed. Those, those ones lasted. Pretty much all the ones that I had set up for the guys that were turned down a little bit, they didn't, they didn't come apart. They had a good service life. The things that uh, made the ones I had turned down die were usually related to the wear on the intake side of the piston. And then once I started gutting the intakes, those saws, they, they just lasted. You know, I turned them right back up. They still lasted. So there's just a lot of mishmash in there. And you guys can pretty much come to your own conclusions. And uh, I certainly can't tell you with any sense of of uh, certainty that my theory is correct. The only thing I can tell you is the saws that I did turn down to under 13,000 from that era survived. The ones that I caught before the PTO side bearing beat open the pocket, the ones I put the steel cage bearings in where I had caught them or the customer brought them to me going lean because the, the nylon had come apart, started sucking in air there. Those would take out the seal once that bearing would wobble a little bit, it would start that uh, crankshaft would open up the seal a little bit, suck in air. And if I caught them or my customers caught them before they actually failed catastrophically and took out the case by opening up the PTO side bearing pocket, all those saws that I was able to catch and put steel cage bearings in, still out there. They all survived. So the takeaway for me was they were fighting one, possibly two issues. And, you know, Husky may have been responding to the, the bigger piston rattling those cases apart early on with the steel cage bearings. And maybe that was one of the reasons why they went to the nylons. And then another issue might have been introduced in manufacturing where... You know, they were running hot, and then the nylon cages were getting brittle and cracking, and then they'd fail. Because when I took them out and put the steel cage bearings in, slapped them together, glued them together with 1184, those saws didn't, didn't fail. They fell. The steel cage bearing in those cases where I had put in the steel locating pins, I did that without thinking about it. I just put the steel in every time. And it's possible that the plastic locating pins were yet yeah, a third issue that were creating issues. You know, so when I put in the steel cage bearings and the steel locating pins and then I glued them all together and then I set them up where they were running, you know, 12, 8, 12, 9, those saws never failed. They lasted for years and years, a lot longer than the, the way they came from the factory. Then all of a sudden they stopped coming, which means and the dealer stopped having problems with them, which is because Husky had solved the problem, whatever it was. How does this all relate to you, the guy who's listening to this video? One, 
It's a whole bunch of speculation and observations on my part. And like I said, I have no way of quantifying that, telling you that that's fact and true. It's just my speculations. But when you combine all that, how that affected me, is I always put steels in these things, unless they already have them like this one does. I always put steel locating pins. I always glue the cases together with 1184 plus a gasket. I always put the case screws in with 1184, which kind of glues them together. And I just did that instinctively, but that might have been one of the reasons. Little things like that added up to come up with a more reliable build. And, um, and as I started getting into it, I started putting in the, the later version of the wrist pins, you know, and what I could, I'd use the later version of the cranks, but a lot of times you can't. The saws I've put together, they lasted. And most of my, the people who I gave them to were, were people who ran them a lot, you know. And most of the people who are going to watch this don't run their saws that much. So my next premise is, for most of the people who are building these junk pile saws for like uh, firewood use or fun, it doesn't freaking matter. They're not going to blow up. Put them together with whatever you got, just like I'm doing here. And the purpose of this saw is to prove that even though it has aftermarket cases, uh, Chinese bearings and seals, and a blend of Chinese and, and Husqvarna parts, it's going to outlast my desire to run this saw. That's my speculation. My first build, it lasted six months, and in those six months, it probably got more time than it'll ever get in the rest of its life. So if I build it back... To a little bit better with a better crank. You know, I bet I run this saw for years. Either that or I'll give it to somebody, which is probably what's going to happen. They'll run it for years and it'll never be a problem. So for 90% of the people building these saws, stick in the steels, use this stuff here between the gasket and the cases and then the screws. Make sure you use these steel pins and then just run them. I think you'll be fine is my my humble opinion if you can get these thin wrist pins and stock pistons i think that's probably a a good move as well i want to prove that even with the junk parts these things will still last long enough to have fun with right so i warm these up on the wood stove and let me see if i can reasonably quickly get them together when you know oil came out and made a mess of that so I think what I'm going to do is go take this and set it on the fireplace and let it cook that uh, 1184 a little bit for me so anyway